Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and today we're visiting with Robin Bertram, author of the soon-to-be-released book, No Regrets, How Loving Deeply and Living Passionately Can Impact Your Legacy Forever. Robin, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you, Rab Rabbi. It's great to be here with you. It's great to have you. Robin is an author, a seasoned conference speaker, and the former host of the nationally syndicated television program, Freedom Today. She brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to women's platforms across the country. She often appears as a keynote speaker at women's conferences, retreats, and media seminars where her straightforward approach and in-depth biblical insights are healing hearts, transforming lives as she de delivers vibrant messages of encouragement, freedom, and victory in Jesus Christ. You can find her at robinbertram.tv on the web. Robin, this uh, story that you've told in No Regrets, uh, going all the way back to some challenges you faced in your life, walks us through an understanding of how to live a No Regrets life. We actually have the No Regrets Hour right here on Revealing the Truth once a month with Robin Stoppy, uh, Rhonda Stoppy, who has uh, created the No Regrets Woman, the No Regrets Mother, the No Regrets Life, living life with no regrets. And so we've embraced this concept of a regret-free life that Paul talks about uh, forgetting what's behind and yes. pressing on. And not that any of us have accomplished this, but this we try to do. Now. Your story takes us to a point in time when you were facing quite a difficult challenge. But your faith journey, you're up to the point of ministering to thousands of women on cruises, and conferences. That's kind of the point you arrived at, but how did you get there? Where did it all begin for you? Well, Rabbi, my journey started as a small child. I, I grew up, first of all, in a pastor's home. My dad was a pastor for 50 years. Um, he was a dear, loving, kind, godly man. Um, on his deathbed, he looked me in the eye and he said, Robin, I have no regrets. And so that kind of started me on a journey. And as I, as I, I really uh, had introspection at that time, how could a man live his entire life, 84 years, and get to the end of his life's journey and actually say with all confidence and honesty of heart, I have no regrets. So I started to look at his life and my life, Rabbi. Um, you know, I, I looked back as a young woman, I, I uh, had some challenges that I had to face early on. I was saved at the age of 13. Okay. Um, I accepted Jesus and um, I, I walked with Jesus. I believed Jesus. Um, when I was a young woman, I had some difficulties. And I, I was uh, in my late 20s, I started to have pretty severe panic attacks. And those um, panic attacks really drove me to delve closer to God and deeper into His Word. And I, I went to my medical doctor and he said at the time, he said, Robin, he said, I, I'll give you some medication. It's okay. A lot of women have to take it. He sent me home. Um, I took that medication for about three or four days. And Rabbi, I said, I know this is not what God has planned for me. And so uh, at that time I, I was working um, the Lord sent me home. I was an optician. I managed an optometric practice for 13 years. My children were small at this time. And I, I vividly remember um, driving home one day from work. It was about a 45 minute drive. I worked in Lewisburg, West Virginia, managing the optometric practice. And I remember I was in the car that day and the, the Lord so vividly uh, spoke to my heart. And he said, I want you to go home and know me. Mm. And now what was so interesting about that, Rabbi, is I was saved. I was in church. I was a believer. But it was so overwhelming and so powerful to me that day that I remember thinking, 
I have to do this. At the time, my husband and I were, we were young. We had um, just built a beautiful, large home because both of us worked. Um, my mother helped uh, with my children, so I did, wasn't concerned about childcare. Um, so, but we had built this life around this two income family. Uh, so I went home and I told my husband and he thought I had lost my mind. <laughs> <laughs> he thought that's just that's crazy why why you know he, so he had a struggle with that at first so it took about a year of convincing him that it was really God and not Robin um, and in that year we we really did pray about uh, is this what God wants for our lives um, and so it was I he agreed I quit my job and I went home and I started reading scripture two to three hours a day. And Rabbi, one day I read the scripture, so simple, perfect love casts out fear. How simple. But that day, Rabbi, that scripture took root in my heart and the panic attacks stopped. Now, you know, I, it's, it's so amazing to me that something uh, as simple as, as, as one scripture can radically change a life. But it was at that point that I understood the power of God's written word when we accept it, when we believe it in our hearts. And so that really started a journey for me. And uh, I, I started delving into the word like never before. And my life radically changed from that point, even as a young woman. Robin, you, you grew up as a pastor's kid. We hear both ends of the spectrum about pastor kids uh, that they embraced, they rejected, they rebelled, they weighed in. Now you had a very, very strong foundation. So what were you thinking when these panic attacks all of a sudden appeared? Well, it was really odd because I didn't understand them. I didn't understand what was going on. Um, and really, I was I was driven into my prayer closet by the power of the Holy Spirit to seek out answers from God. And I remember praying one day, and the Lord gave me a memory as I was a small child. I had been outside. I, I fell into a ditch. Um, my sister and I were playing. My father was building a new home. And when I, when I opened my eyes, a snake was crawling over my forehead and, and down the side of my arm. And uh, my sister looked in that ditch and she screamed. And um, she was just a year older. My mother ran outside. She grabbed a hoe. She looked in the ditch and she went to strike at the snake. And it jumped straight up at her missed her, drew, fell back into the ditch, and then she chopped its head off. But Pastor, that's the day that fear had taken root in my heart. And I really believed most of my life up to that time as a young woman, that fear was part of my identity. And it was not until the day that I read that scripture that I understood, wait a minute, fear is not from God. That's a message sent by the devil, yes. and I don't have to agree with it. And so I was thankful that the Lord showed me and gave me understanding of where that even began. And, um, and I was healed. I did not take medication. Now, I want you to understand that it was so bad at times, I felt like if I took an aspirin, I would die. If I, you know, if I just, it just, I couldn't speak in crowds, I couldn't talk to people. I mean, I really struggled through panic attacks. But when the Lord set me free, I was free indeed. Your story is compelling in a lot of ways. There's approximately 40% of all Americans take some kind of depression, anxiety, medications. We just had this conversation with a guest the other day talking about how many people are caught up in anx being anxious, depressed, uh, fearful, and they don't turn to the Word. They turn yes. to a doctor for an answer. And this is the starvation in America. Uh, yeah. Our hunger, hunger problem is not about the impoverished. Our hunger problem is spiritual. 
there is a poverty, spiritual poverty, gripping this nation. A spiritual poverty that says, I'm a believer, I don't have to read the Bible. I'm a believer, if my pastor wants me to know it, he'll tell it to me on Sunday morning. I can talk about the sermon, but nobody eats one meal a week and survives. And nobody says, I'm gonna have one meal on Sunday. It's only gonna last for about 30 minutes. I'm gonna get all of my nutrition that's gonna last me for seven days in that one meal, and I'm not gonna feed myself ever again. And this is contrary to the Word of God. And so your, your experience is one that should provoke every single person to go to the Word of God, to open up their Bibles. They think it's boring. They think it's hard to understand. It's a thick book. That is correct. It is a thick book. The thought of reading a 1,200-page book is, is daunting to the average person. However, since it is a dialogue, it's not something that's reading like War and Peace or uh, Dostoevsky. It is a dialogue. God is exchanging with you through the entire dynamic of Scripture and showing you and revealing to you. And because God brought you back to the point where you could completely disarm, you could unplug fear. Now what that does is fear is the point man for all other spirits. Yes, you yes. Could, you could have dealt with depression, but if you didn't deal with fear, then the door is still open. He's kind yes. of like the usher at the church. He's the one that holds the door open. Fear holds the door open and spirits come and spirits go and you go for prayer and all of a sudden you're feeling better and about three or four days later, all of a sudden you feel horrible again. You don't know why because the door is still open until you shut the door on fear. You have a gateway of people. It's a revolving spiritual door of attack and we give Satan so much credit, extraordinary amount of credit. Every person I know basically said to me, well, I'm under attack. And I say, how is that possible that everybody is under a spiritual attack? For 40 days, Jesus spent with Satan who tempted him and three times he spoke to him. Three times he quoted from Deuteronomy. After the third time, the Lord tells us that Satan was frustrated and left him. Now, this spiritual warfare wasn't dousing him with gasoline and setting him on fire or trampling him under his feet. He quoted the word of God, which is to tell us that the word of God is the two-edged sword that cuts, that divides through bone to marrow, that this is the exactly. weapon of mass destruction against all the plans of the enemy. Robin, why don't people get that? Rabbi, you know, I, I, here, here's what I believe. I believe that people don't, when things are good, they don't feel like they need anything. And unfortunately, we live in a country where we have all the food, all the entertainment, all the luxuries anyone could ever possibly need. And we're cold in heart because we don't have a need. When you have a need, you will know to look. But the problem, Rabbi, is people wait until they have a need to start to delve into the very answers. I know for certain uh, the journey that I've walked my life Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If I had not spent that time in the Word, reading, delving into Scripture, understanding what is written, I couldn't, the Word won't work for you right. if you don't believe it or understand it. It's, there's nothing wrong with the Word because it's powerful and true and active regardless. But you've got to believe it. You've got to search for it. God tells us to search for it. And when we search, he will give us the answers. This is a real concern for me, too, because I believe the American church is telling people that God does not speak today, but he does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. 
He speaks to our heart through the power of the Holy Spirit. He, he's indwelling in our hearts. He leads us, He guides us, and He teaches us. But not if we do not expect that. And I think, I think of times through my life, Rabbi, that I would have been dead had it not been for the faith that I have in Jesus and His name and His word. I think Gandhi was quoted as saying, I would believe in Jesus except for Christianity. Yes, yes, I remember reading that quote. You know, scary, it's, scary it's, thought. It's almost the worst thing that happened to Jesus is Christianity. And yes. it's stunning to me as a Jew who spent 44 years in the synagogue, uh, there was nothing compelling about looking across the aisle at the Gentile world that said, wow, I want what they have. Because there was no real dynamic. You know, there was people that would say, I'll pray for you. I was like, okay. Uh, but it wasn't until I joined a company where they actually uh, gave me an incredible opportunity, old friend, and said, my only requirement is we have a Bible study on Wednesday morning, you have to come. It's a company requirement. I said, sure, I'll do that. And so I went to that. And, you know, I planted a lot of seeds, but I didn't know it at the time. But several years later is when I came to faith. But this relationship, you know, you've been married for how many years now? 31. 31 years. How many days have you gone without speaking to your husband? I don't think any, <laughs> not to my knowledge. So the, rule, the reason you have a healthy relationship is there's an ongoing dialogue. You actually communicate. Now we know that in the natural, but the reason we know it in the natural is because God uses the things of the natural to reveal supernatural truth. Absolutely. So if you have to have a relationship with your children, with your husband, with your spouse, that requires ongoing and regular communication, why would it be different with God? Absolutely, absolutely. He requires that we have that ongoing communication. And, and I do believe that um, people buy into the lie that, you know, you just, it's not possible. But God's word says, my sheep hear my voice, they follow me. Well, how can you hear and follow if there's not a communication? And how can you learn if there's not a teacher? Um, so, you know, it's simply reading the word and taking it for what it actually says instead of what some pastor in a pulpit has to do a 30-minute three-point lecture on scripture, you have to be dedicated, Rabbi. You have to dis decide in your own heart, either it's, tr it's all true or none of it's true. And if it's all true, it's worth the time and investment to spend reading that word regularly, daily, daily prayer and daily reading. I think about my life and where it would have been. It's just a scary thought in my mind. Had it not been for the intervention of God. I remember even at 16, um, one day I was, I was uh, dropping a friend off after a band concert. Um, I played in the high school band and she did too. And a uh, 17, I guess. And I was driving her home and I um, hit a patch of ice. And Rabbi, I remember the car was sliding to the edge of the road and there was a um, about a two feet grassy spot and past that was a, a 40 foot drop into an icy river. And I remember crying out, Jesus, help me. And I'm telling you, it was though God picked that car up and pushed it back on the road because there was one option, and the option was that icy embankment. Right. And I know at that time it was because I read scripture and believed it. I believed in God's intervention. And I know that day he heard my cry. And I think that when, we're, when our heart is truly open to God, when we believe that he hears us, when we cry out to him, he will respond. Not always the way we want him to, but he will respond. Robin, people look at us and say, well, that's great for them. 
but you know that's why they talk about it because they've had all these amazing encounters but you know I've never had any of that and it's great to hear about it and know that other people are uh, are hearing from God but I, I just don't hear from God I'm dry I go to church I try my best but it's just not jumping off the page at me it's not what they need to understand is that you and I weren't always like this. Right. You talk about from 17 to 27. You went off to college. You got your degree. You went in business. You married. You had this house. It was a two-household income. Life was good. Uh, you continued in a relationship with the Lord, but you were spending time at work. You were spending time raising children. You were spending time with your husband. You were in a routine going to church when you could go to church when there wasn't a kid with, who was homesick or there wasn't something pressing. And that period of time from high school to the panic attacks and this decision to leave, did you find that you were less inclined, less engaged in this relationship with God? Otherwise, he wouldn't have needed to call you back to it. Right, right. You know, I, yes, there was a point where I, I would go to church, but there was something, even as, a, even as a young woman, there was a hunger there that, that I had in my heart. And, and I think that's because I did have um, a relationship early on with the Lord where I, when I read Scripture, Rabbi, I believed it. Mm -hmm. There was something in me, even in the days where I was not, um, I didn't have the time to, I didn't make the time to set and read and really delve in. Uh, but God did put a hunger in my heart. And I know that, that there's dry seasons in everyone's life. And there are things that will press you into God like never before. But the problem that that I keep going back to is you, you cannot wait until there's a major catastrophe and then expect to reach out to God for a miracle. And Rabbi, miracles are around us every day. We just don't have the eyes to see. And for that person that's sitting in uh, church mundane, Sunday after Sunday, dry, not feeling it, the fact that they have breath in their life is a miracle from God. The fact that they got up that morning is a miracle of God. The fact that they live in a beautiful country with freedom is a gift and a miracle from God. And so I encourage people to start to look what God is doing right now. It doesn't have to be a mountain that's being moved in front of you. It's the miracle of a beautiful flower that you that you look at and just enjoy. It's, it's, it's uh, the love that you have for your family. Miracles are all around. We just don't have eyes to see. When you actually take a moment and you think about this body God has given us, the processes it goes through, the filtering of water, the purification yes. that goes on, the fact that you don't have to consciously think about making your heart beat, your, your lungs breathe, your liver cleanse blood, your kidneys purify blood, and, and uh, all of these things that it does automatically because God has wired it in such a way that you are a walking, living computer system that is so automatic and 99% of the time glitch free. Yes. That you have more trouble with your laptop than you have <laughs> with your own body. And you yeah. hit this point of my age of 65, and you realize that this is a miracle. It's a miracle that I can move my fingers and I can, without giving it any thought, you have an instantaneous response in your body to whatever it is that your brain tells it to do. This is incredible. Yes. We marvel at the fact that an iPhone has uh, more processing power than the first moon launch and so it's just extraordinary what is going on in the world today uh, and, and rabbi i believe god is an if then god you know he wants us to seek him out and i think that's where we fall short too because we don't 
understand if you're in that dry uh, season of life or if you're um, you know you're just going through the routine of religion I think the challenge should be for each one of us is to really seek God out to seek him out to to search out his uh, intervention in our own life because when we start to do that I can assure you you will see God he will show himself. Amen. But it's Amen. up to us first. It is. We're talking with Robin Bertram, author of the soon-to-be-released book, but you can pre-order it now at a great price on Amazon. Go to IgnitingNation.com and click on No Regrets, How Living Deeply and Living Passionately Can Impact Your Legacy Forever. When we return, Robin's going to take us to that point in time where the doctors gave her a diagnosis and told her to go home and prepare herself for what was to come. When we return, we're going to take you right to that day. We'll be right back. This is Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Igniting a Nation Ministries and your host for Revealing the Truth right here on the Igniting a Nation Broadcasting Network. I'm coming to you today with a very special offer from one of our very prominent guests, Dr. Carl Gallops. For your tax-deductible contribution of $30 or more, Pastor Carl Gallops will send you a signed copy of his new best-selling book, When the Lion Roars. In this book, you will discover what the Bible really says about the unprecedented demonic outpouring of the last days, the spirit of the days of Noah, the connection of technology and prophecy fulfillment, the spirit of Sodom and Gomorrah, apostasy in the last days church, why Turkey is central to last day's prophecy. Why Israel is the centerpiece of end time prophecy. The historical truth about Islam and ISIS. The Shemitah. The mystery of 666. And how Christians and the church should respond to these prophetic times. We are living in intense but exciting times. We're living in prophetically unprecedented times. Be on guard. Prepare your heart and mind made certain you have a biblical balanced understanding of our generation. Be ready with wisdom and perspective. We have been raised up for such a time as this. The lion of God's prophetic word is roaring. Do you hear its call? Send your check payable to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. Hi, I'm Angela Waite, and I just finished my interview on Revealing the Truth with Rabbi Eric Walker. I hope that in some way you will be touched by my story and that you will receive the healing you so desperately desire. I would like to share my story with you and send you a personalized signed copy of my book, Bomb Pops, Blow Dryers, and Butterfly Kisses. For your tax-deductible gift of $25 or more to Igniting a Nation, Inc., I will personally send you my book along with a note of encouragement as you take this journey with me. You will not only be supporting the work of Igniting a Nation, but all the proceeds that I receive from book sales goes to support Ramsey's Rescue, which targets the physical and spiritual care of the little ones who have been abandoned. It is the goal of this ministry to provide food, clothing, education, medical, a safe and loving home, and hope. Please help support both ministries with your gift and make a difference in so many lives today. Send your check payable to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. May the Lord bless you for your generosity and support. This is the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Igniting a Nation and host of Revealing the Truth, right here on the Igniting a Nation Broadcasting Network, inviting you to join me every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday for our Prophecy in the News classes. Each week I take the headlines from around the world that have a biblical connection and present them in a way that brings the news and the Bible to life. There are over 2,500 prophecies in the Bible. And there are so few classes available to see how they connect with world events. We cover everything from Islamic terrorism to the changing relationships between Russia, Turkey, Iran, Syria, and Israel. Prophecy is unfolding before our very eyes, and to many, it is complicated and hard to understand. 
In just one hour each week, you'll be given the tools and the biblical connection to world events. With so much going on and so few reliable sources of news, I encourage you to join me every Monday night at 7 o'clock p.m. at St. Mark United Methodist Church in Northport, every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at Beechwood Baptist Church in Mount Olive, and every Thursday night at 7 p.m. at Mountain Chapel United Methodist Church in Vestavia. If you want to make sense out of what's happened in the world around you, this is the class for you. All are welcome. Times and location addresses can be found on our website at IANBN.com. I hope to see you there. Shalom. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're visiting with Robin Bertram, author of the soon-to-be-released book, No Regrets, How, Live How Loving Deeply and Living Passionately Can Impact Your Legacy Forever. Robin, welcome back to the program. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Robin, when we uh, wrapped up the first segment, we kind of closed with a devastating piece of news. You had transcended this uh, panic. You had weighed into a life of study, of ministering. You launched your ministry. You launched your television show. You launched writing a book. You really were plugged in doing women's conferences. And then all of a sudden something changed. What changed? Well, Rabbi, I was... Um having a, a party for my daughter. She had graduated from NC State in engineering. Um, I had a lot of my family had uh, come to Hilton Head to visit. Uh, so we were celebrating her graduation. I had an issue a couple of um, days before. I had been at a friend's home and I volunteered to help her paint. And so my arm was bothering me and I really thought that I had pulled a muscle. Okay. And um, so my sister and my niece was visiting and I, I was having, I was struggling picking up a glass, like a glass of water. And my home was filled with company and it was a, a time of celebration. And my sister said, you need to get to a doctor. And I said, there's no, there's no way I have this, um, celebration and then tomorrow the next day we were leaving to go to Italy for a family vacation and so um, I said I just don't have time and my niece and my sister said no we're, we're gonna we're gonna go so there was a walk-in clinic just a few minutes from my home and I said oh okay I, I guess I'll run over there so we ran over to the walk-in clinic and I was expecting the doctor to say go home and take some Tylenol and you'll be fine and um, I explained to the nurse what I was experiencing and she left the room rather abruptly and she said the doctor will be right with you and just in a minute the doctor came in and he asked me just a few series of questions and he looked me in the eye and he said, I'm very, very sorry to tell you, Robin, that this is neurological. And I thought, neurological? I don't even know what that means. I am a perfectly healthy woman. <laughs> I've never been sick a day in my life. I, I think I pulled a muscle. You must be wrong. And he said, he gave me four diagnoses. And um, he said, it could be one of these four things but he ruled out one that day he's he said he felt pretty confident it was not that he said as soon as you get home from your vacation you need to get you need to go immediately to a doctor so i said okay so my i went home and i just kind of i was stunned i i sat in my living room uh the company had left i was getting ready to pack and i i felt like i was just frozen in time i, I just couldn't hardly move and my husband said, let's just go. Let's just go ahead and go on vacation. It'll be good for you. We'll go and when we come back, we'll get you back to a doctor. And so I, I, I acquiesced and I said, okay. I wanted to spend time with my family and we had made these wonderful plans. So we went to Italy. We were um, in the Tuscany Valley. And Rabbi, every day we would go out and tour the Tuscany area. But at night when I would come home, I would hit the floor. My knees 
would hit the floor, my face into the carpet, and I would cry out to God every single night for most of the night, for most of the night. And so when I got home, I decided I'm not going to go to the doctor until I go to the church. <laughs> I'm going to get anointed and prayed over first before I go to the doctor, which I did. And then um, uh, I, I, my doc, I couldn't get into the neurologist for five months. And so I picked up the phone and I called um, Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. And um, I told them my symptoms. Again, the nurse got a, a doctor immediately, and they said, we want you to come immediately. So I went, um, they ruled out, after a long series of two days of testing, they ruled out everything but one diagnosis. And that diagnosis is in the book, and I would love for the readers to- So they're gonna have to, fi to find out the details, they're gonna have to get the book yeah. and read the details. Now, during this time, you, uh, kind of work through the illness and as you came out the other side of it you was it then that your dad was no my my father had died a couple of years prior to that but during this time what I'd like uh, the viewers to understand rabbi I was five minutes from my home could not find my way home mm literally could not find, could not figure out how to get home. Uh, so so for about a year and a half, I struggled with this intense battle. Um, and I decided to um, get every scripture I could get on healing and start reading that scripture out loud. And so the Lord took me during this process of, of Looking back at that, that, that statement, it was a deathbed statement my father had made. He said, I have no regrets. And so during this year and a half, I started to ponder that, that statement. And I, I put together thoughts in my head, which became this book, How Do You Live a Life That You Can Say You Have No Regrets and, 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 and Leave a Spiritual Legacy? My father left a spiritual legacy, and that's what No Regrets is all about. It's about building a legacy first, then living a legacy, mm -hmm. and then leaving a legacy. Because one thing I thought, Rabbi, during this time is I thought over and over in my head, what do I have in my hands that I can pass forward to the next generation? It's not money. It's not cars, it's not homes, it's not luxury, it's not jewelry. What do I have of value in my hand to pass forward? And my, my thoughts ran through my head, what did my father pass forward to me? He was a man of, of uh, meager means. Uh, you know, a pastor, he planted five churches, uh, sang in gospel groups across the country. But money, we didn't have a lot of money, but what we did have, I watched my father love and love deeply um, on his, uh, at his funeral. And this book is about living. It's not about dying. But at my father's funeral, I, I felt literally like I was at a wedding celebration. Person after person, line after line, came to me and said, Robin, had it not been for your father, mm -hmm. my family would not have made it. Robin, have it not been for your father's prayers, I couldn't have made it. And just personal, and I thought, what a beautiful spiritual legacy and gift. And I wanted that same gift to pass forward to my children. Robin, when <clears throat> you talk about a legacy, most people don't think about what they're going to leave behind. They're scrambling for money, for wealth, for something that they can write in a will. And the last will and testament you think about those words. What is my desire? What is my will? And what is my testimony? Yes. The last, my last will for my family, my desire for my family is for them to prosper, to prosper in the Lord. And my testament, my testimony, okay, will be what I'm leaving behind. Now, you look at that document and you say, well, I'm leaving behind a house, you know, life insurance policy, and uh, these investments and things like that, but that's not really what feeds a family. That's not really what leaves behind a, f uh, a, a rich legacy 
of what it is you want to bestow upon them when you're no longer here. So you have captured this concept so beautifully that this building a legacy is something you have to be intentional about. Yes. You don't have to face death in order to do this. Uh, your message is, is that I went to the brink of my own mortality. And in that time, I drew upon the parting words of my father on his deathbed that said, I have no regrets. I've okay. lived my life for the Lord. I've lived my life to the fullest and I have no regrets. And he left you that impartation that became a foundation for the rest of your life. Yeah. It was there in how he raised you. It was there in your love of the Lord, but now you had a goal. How do I live my life without regret? And how do I pass this message on to those that don't know how? Because right. my experience is every person's experience. And this is what God has called you to do. So this building a legacy is foundational. You talk about living like you are dying. We're not promised our next breath. This, Absolutely. This concept of putting off Yes. Waiting yes. until you step outside and a bus comes around and you step off the curb and it's done. Absolutely. Rabbi, it starts with salvation. And if you don't accept Jesus as your Lord, then you're not going to have a legacy to pass on. You might have money. You might have uh, homes and jewelry, but you don't have a legacy that's impactful, that changes lives. So you start with a, a foundation of salvation. It's got to start there. And, you know, I've worked with people who have thought they're saved, and they're not. You know, people that um, their lives never change. They, they go to church, but nothing changes in them. So at first, you really have to do introspection. Are you 100% sure if you died tomorrow, are you going to make it in? Yes. And if you've got that assurance, you're saved. But if, you're, if you don't have that assurance, you may not be. So it starts with salvation. Um, and then the next, you can't leave a legacy until you live a legacy. So what does your life say? So I really started to investigate, uh, you know, do you live the type of, of life that loves and loves deeply? Apostle Paul taught us in uh, 1 Corinthians 13 that love is patient, love is kind, yeah. love is not jealous, it's not bo boastful. See, we have a misconception. Apostle Paul was talking to the church, Rabbi. Yes. He was, he was, that was not a scripture for wedding ceremonies. That was a scripture to teach the church how to love and love deeply like Jesus Christ taught us to love. So in the book, I give a 30-day love challenge. And I ask my readers to go through and just document day after day. How did I do today? Did I pass my, was I patient? Was I kind? Was I jealous? Did I struggle? Did I think someone else um, more highly than myself? And I, I challenge them to do that because that's truly the love walk that when we leave that kind of love, we're impactful in other people's lives. And people notice. People watch your love walk yes. more than they listen to the words that you say. No question. So, no question. Now, you, you take us to, it's interesting the parallels you draw into how people prepare for death. Uh, they put their house in order. They uh, invest in uh, things of the world, instruments of investment, stocks, bonds, insurance policies, those kind of things. But that's not what lasts. The, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Amen. So this investment that you talk about is an investment of love. This yes. investment yes. that there's no one who's ever laid on the deathbed and regrets loving yes. a lot. They never say, I, I there's two things you never hear. One is, I wish I had worked another day. And the other part is, is I wish I had spent more time with my family. I wish I had 
invested more in my children. I wish I was a better father, a better mother, more engaging, but the busyness of life distracted me. I was trying to leave them something more than what I was left. And as I sit down with families, no one ever says, well, the best thing that my father ever gave me was money. Yes. No, they remember the time when he threw the ball. He taught them how to drive, ride a horse, fix a car, whatever it was. Those are the memories that they draw upon. Right. So if that's what the harvest is, why don't we spend more time in the planting? Absolutely. I asked a man um, one day, I said, what, if you knew you were going to die tomorrow, what would you do today? And he said, I would make things right with people. And I said, so why are you waiting? So in other words, that's, that's part of this uh, encouragement in the book to make things right with people now. You don't have to be dying. You can take the steps to make things right with people in your lives, people that you've been disassociated with for whatever reason. Um, be the first to call and say, I'm sorry. And that's a, that's a hard thing to do, especially when people have been separated for, for whatever reason. So I really encourage the reader to take a, a look inside and, and try to do the things now uh, that they would do if they knew there was no tomorrow. And how important is that? Um, one, of the, one of the chapters is about uh, gratitude. Mm -hmm. And I, I, really, I really feel this strongly because I know when I went through this trauma, things looked different to me on this side of that trauma. And what I mean by that is I now take the time to embrace every moment look at life from a different perspective and be thankful, thankful to God for everything he's given. Robin, your husband went through this with you and then he's now on the other side of this with you. What does he say that he's seen change? What do your children say that they've seen change? Well, I think for my, my family personally, um, I think what actually occurred in, in all of them was a, an increased faith because they watched me go through this period of time where life was dark and it was hard. And um, they saw the struggles firsthand. And you can't deny that when you watch that happen in someone's life, especially a family member, right. you can't deny what God is doing. So I think for each one of them in their own special way, there was an increased faith in God, in his, in his word, in his power. Because again, I don't think you can wait until you have a tragedy to tap into right. your own faith. You might need a miracle and your miracle may be only as big rabbi as your faith. Now for some of us, that's not a very big miracle. Uh, but God challenges us uh, to to step out of where we are today and believe him, take his word for what is written. And we will grow in faith when we when we do that. We will grow. So I think we all grew in faith. It was a, it was a test of our faith. Wow, that's uh, encouraging to many for those that are only seeing small miracles then the question is, is the reflection in the mirror, what is your faith? Do you really expect a total stranger to bless you financially? Do you expect a total stranger to walk in the door and heal you? Do you expect a total stranger to provide for your family? Because this is what most people expect from God. God is a total stranger to them. And they go to this total stranger in their time of need and it, they have to get to know him to understand that God's true nature, to understand his word. It says that God's word will not return void. It doesn't say your words will not return void. It says yes. his words 
will not return void. So if I don't know his language, if I don't know what he promises, if I don't know anything about him, I am appealing to a total, total stranger, someone I have no knowledge of whatsoever, and expecting to be the one that some billionaire passes me by on the street and stops and says, you know what, I feel your pain, here's $100,000. <laughs> That's what they expect from God, a total stranger. Yes. Yes, and Rabbi, you know, communication is prayer. And so our prayer life, our prayer life is an extension of our faith. Oh, no because if, if we if we pray and and we don't expect God to move, then he's not going to move. Um and how futile would it be to pray for healing if you didn't expect God to work. So, you know, I think we have a part to play and a lot of times we don't like to hear that. You know, people don't like to hear that they have a part to play in things, but I, I really believe that God wants that kind of communication with us and he expects us to communicate with him. And so, so I ask the, the viewers, what is your prayer life like? Are you are you um, are you expecting God to move when you when you pray? Are you you know we all sit at dinner and we have these rote prayers, Lord, thank you for the food and, and bless it, but our hearts are not in it. Right. And if you if you think about something as simple as blessing the food, um, how dis dishonorable to God when we casually enter in and dismiss it as though it's nothing. So my point being is our prayer life needs to be an extension of what we believe in our hearts and what we believe in our hearts has to be birthed out of the written word of God or we have nothing to stand on. Well, that's exactly right. When trouble comes, most people reach out to the Lord and mm -hmm. I'm not God, but I can imagine the response is, I provided for your health all the way up to this point and you never thanked me for being healthy. Why is it that it takes something like this to get your attention? Why wouldn't you enjoy richly waking up every day with a new sunrise and embrace what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that anyone who's a Messiah is a new creation. I woke up this morning a Messiah. It wasn't when I made that decision 21 years ago. It's, yes. I woke up today as a new creation. And the old is gone. New. All things new. And so we see this, that we take for granted every gift from God until we need it. And what you've done is you've kind of broken this down. Build a legacy, live a legacy, leave a legacy. And the parts of that to build a life which is a living testimony. It's not your last will and testament, it's your first will and testimony. It's walking in what God has already ordained as his will for your life, that you might be an overcomer by the word of your testimony and the blood of the Lamb. You then issue this 30-day love challenge. And in this 30-day love challenge, you lay out a course for rating yourself, <clears throat> examining yourself. People don't like to do that self-examination, but let me assure you that you'd rather do self-examination to sit in, the th sit in the therapist's office and be asked these questions. So uh, you can ask them now or you can ask them later for many of you, but you're going to have to answer some of these questions. And you take them through uh, this foundational understanding of 1 Corinthians 13 and chart your progress towards the ultimate goal of giving yourself maybe a one on day one to get to a 10 to be intentional about working towards being patient, being kind, uh, being not easily angered, 
And this is a tremendous tool for those that are looking for something to chart their progress. Once you do it and you've taken it on for 30 days, you will now have a system to keep yourself in check that as you're living your legacy, then you'll start to hear the feedback. You'll see it in the countenance of the people that you love. We've been talking with Robin Bertram, author of No Regrets, How Loving Deeply and Living Passionately Can Impact Your Legacy Forever. She walks you through how to build a legacy, live a legacy, and leave a legacy while you're still in the dash. Not the year you were born and not the year you die, but as you live in the dash. Robin Bertram, thank you so much for sharing this with us. Thank you, Charisma House, for sending Robin our way. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.